Charles Lam, and they will be talking about a feature we worked on for HGFS, transparent encryption. So let's start by asking a very basic question, which is, why do we need encryption? Well, well, in recent years, there have been a number of high-profile leaks of sensitive information. Last year, for instance, Sony suffered the interview hack, where hackers released unreleased movie scripts as well as movie footage. And the year before that, Target suffered from a hack where the credit card information of over 77 million holiday shoppers was leaked. Uh, so the postmortems of these attacks are very rarely released, so it's hard to pinpoint if encryption would have solved that, this issue. But I did find in my Google search one situation where it definitely would have. So very recently, actually, earlier this year, the health insurer Anthem, Blue Cross Blue Shield, suffered a hack where approximately 80 million customers' personal information was released, including things like social security numbers and credit card information. And the Wall Street Journal helped me put the issue right in the title. Health insurer Anthem didn't encrypt data in depth. So Anthem is now offering free credit monitoring for all of its affected customers, but the economic impact of the leak is potentially quite great, you know, from the potential credit card fraud as well as identity theft from this leaked information. <coughs> so these leaks are a big deal. They affect tens to hundreds of millions of people. And all these cases, the attackers are after what's called PII, or personally identifiable information. This means things like credit card numbers, social security numbers, or account logins, basically things you wouldn't want hackers getting their hands on. And at least in some of these cases, encryption would have solved the leak. And this is also why encryption is actually a regulatory requirement for many business sectors. Here in the EU, the Data Protection Directive, or DPD, covers a broad range of uh, how data must be stored confidentially on uh, your servers. But within each business sector, there are maybe additional requirements. So within finance, there's PCI DSS, which handles the, credit payment, uh, the, the payment card processing industry. And in the US, for healthcare specifically, there's HIPAA which concerns healthcare data. So it's important to remember that even if you implement encryption, it's only as secure as the weakest link. You need to carefully control access to things like encryption keys, encrypted ciphertext, and most importantly, the two of those together. Because you can use encryption key to decrypt the ciphertext and thus get plain text. And so there are many potential attack vectors a hacker might use to try and get their hands on these two parts of uh, sensitive information. And well, let's walk through some of them. So the first one is physical access. This is perhaps the most straightforward threat. This means when an attacker might, let's say, break into your data center, unrack some of your data nodes, and then walk out with those hard drives containing, again, either encryption keys or encrypted ciphertext. If this seems kind of far-fetched, think about a slightly different attack, but still physical access. Someone might try and buy used hard drives off of eBay and then undelete deleted files. And this has actually happened in real life. Another attack is Network sniffing. So imagine an attacker who breaches through your firewall and then runs something like TCP dump or snort to collect traffic that's moving across the wire in your network. If this data is not encrypted, then it's potentially at risk. And the third and final attack that I'd like to highlight, and perhaps the most difficult one, is that of the rogue user or the rogue admin. So if a hacker compromises a user account, they gain access to all the data that is normally accessible by that user. And if this account is actually a system administrator, it becomes much more serious, perhaps, because sysadmins are typically granted very broad access to the system. And so in either of these cases, the goal is really to limit the amount of access and thus the amount of information leak from the amount of access given to any single user and thus the amount of information leaked if that user is compromised. So to recap, our three attack vectors. The first, physical access affects data which is stored at rest on a hard drive. The next, network sniffing, affects data which is in transit over the network. And finally, and the most difficult one, is the rogue user or rogue admin, where we're really concerned about locking down the access given to any single user, including sysadmins. So given that we are convinced that encryption will solve some of these information leak issues, there's still a question of where to encrypt, and namely why HTTPS is the right place to do your encryption. So looking at our application stack diagram, it looks something like this. We have uh, at the top application, meaning your application code. The next, the database, something like HBase perhaps. HGFS, your distributed file system. And finally, at the very bottom, there's local disk. Uh, looking at this stack, though, there are different trade-offs you get um, depending on where you encrypt. And broadly speaking, as you go from top down, you gain in terms of operational and deployment complexity. It gets easier as you move down the stack. But 
As you move up the stack, you gain in terms of flexibility or the ability to uh, express your application level semantics. Let's take it from two extremes to get the, a feel for the spectrum and the trade-offs. So if you encrypt at the local disk level, uh, it's very easy, it's very simple. You install something like Bormetric or Caldera Navigator Encrypt, and then all of your read and write system calls are transparently uh, working now on encrypted data. And this is, again, simple to install, very easy, and, and it works across the board with all of your legacy existing applications. However, the trade-off is that you can't always express policies which you might want, because each disk is encrypting basically on its own. So if you want to have, let's say, one encryption key per file in HDFS, you couldn't do that by using local disk encryption. Um, taking it from the other side, at the application level, the very highest level, you have all that flexibility. You can express like per file policies, per user policies, per database column policies. If you can code it, you can make it happen in your application code. That is also the trade-off, because the user now is forced to implement all these policies himself. And that only works for that single application. So if you have many different applications who all want to operate on encrypted data, you need to implement encryption each time separately. And this is especially a problem for, let's say, uh, proprietary or legacy applications, which are hard to modify. So overall, you know, local disk is probably not a good option. Application is probably not a good option. And HDS represents sort of a, a sweet spot, we would say. You get really good performance for your encryption. And because it is end-to-end -end happening on the client side, you, you're safe from all these OS-level attacks, which hack at data which, are, which is at rest or in transit. Furthermore, uh, since this is all happening at the HDS level, all of your existing Hadoop applications will continue to work transparently uh, on encrypted data. Finally, because again, it's at HFS level, it's pretty easy to deploy. You already have HFS uh, deployed on your cluster, and it's a matter of configuration to turn on encryption. So let's do, do a brief overview of the high-level architecture of HFS encryption. So here on this diagram, we have the two cluster services, uh, two, uh, the two different kinds of nodes in HGFS, the HGFS name node and the HGFS data node, as well as an HGFS client. As part of HGFS encryption, we've added two new cluster services. The KMS, or key management server, is a caching, high performance, scalable, highly available proxy for a backing key server. The point of the KMS is to provide a unified key API for cluster services, while allowing you to use whatever backing key server you want to use. So for the purposes of this presentation, we'll be using Caldera Navigator, Key Trustee as a backend key server uh, for HGFS encryption and the KMS. So when the client wants to read and write encrypted data to HGFS, the first thing it has to do is get a per file encryption key for that file. And it does that by talking to the KMS. Since the KMS is a proxy, it might need to talk to Key Trustee in the back end to actually uh, get that per file encryption key. But then the KMS will return it back to the client. The client can then use this key to do encrypted data operations to HGFS. The important thing to note here is that we've separated out all the key operations from the data operations. All the key operations go to the KMS and key trustee, while all the data operations go to HGFS. Key trustee and the KMS never need to handle encrypted ciphertext, and HGFS never needs to handle encryption keys. Because we have this separation here, we actually have separate administrative domains for your keys versus your data as well, meaning no single admin user has access to both all of your encryption keys stored in your key server as well as your encrypted ciphertext stored in HDFS. And so if you glaze over, over everything I just said, here's a recap slide for all of that. Um, so at a very high level, we've added these two new cluster services to, HGF, uh, to your Hadoop cluster for HDFS encryption. The first, the KMS, is a caching high performance, highly available proxy for a backing key server, typically key trustee. Together, they manage your encryption keys for your cluster. Important here, the important thing to note here is that HGFS never touches your encryption keys. The encryption HGFS is end-to-end -end and happens on the client side. You know, data is protected both when it's stored at rest on disk as well as in transit over a network. Furthermore, we tightly control access to encryption keys. And these keys are per file, which greatly limits the amount of access given to any single user. Uh, furthermore, we have separate administrative domains for your key, for your key services versus, your, your, versus HDFS, meaning that rogue admins do not have access both to all of your keys as well as all of your data because you have two admins now. Because we chose to implement encryption at the HDFS level, we also have API transparency for existing Hadoop applications. This means things like, things like HBase, Impala, Pig, Hive, and so on all continue to work without code changes on encrypted data. And finally, this encryption is high performance. We'll be talking more about that later on. 
And now I'll be hanging out to my coworker Charles to talk about the architectural concepts that are part of HTTPS encryption. Thanks, Andrew. So I'm gonna talk about some of the architectural concepts that we used in HDFS encryption. Uh, the first of them is an encryption zone. And you may think of a zone as a zone in a network of, uh, in, in a zone of nodes in a network topology. In this case, it's actually a zone of path names in the HDFS namespace. The second concept are the two key types that we use, encryption zone keys and data encryption keys. And data encryption keys take two states, uh, unencrypted and encrypted. We'll talk a bit about those. Andrew talked about the key management server, the KMS. I'm gonna go into more detail about how that's used and its interactions with the keys. And then I'll tie all that together by showing you the paths and the interactions of these components um, in a read and a write operation on HDFS in an encryption zone. So first of all, the encryption zones, and we abbreviate these as EZ. An encryption zone is a pretty simple concept. It's a space in the HDFS namespace where everything that's written into it is encrypted and everything that's read out of it is decrypted. And this is all done transparently. So it's designated from a particular directory that the administrator designates and everything below that, subdirectories and files in, within that are within the encryption zone. Um, no code changes are required, and legacy code and new applications can use the encryption feature simply by specifying path names that are within the encryption zone, so it's transparent. An encryption zone has a very simple invariant, and that is that everything in the encryption zone is encrypted, and everything outside of it is, is not encrypted. And in order to enforce this, we don't do any encryption in place of existing files. So if you create an encryption zone, it has to be created on an empty directory. Renames in, into and out of the encryption zone are also prohibited to keep that invariant true. And encryption zones cannot be nested, so you can't have an encryption zone within an encryption zone. The encryption zones can be set up in a couple of different ways. Fundam the easiest way is, is just to designate the root of the file system as the encryption zone, and then everything on, in that file system in the HDFS namespace is encrypted. It's simple. Um, it's at the expense, though, of having very little compartmentalization. It's just one big encryption zone, and everything in there is under the same encryption zone key. Um, however, it is easy to set up. The, opposite, the other way is to use an encryption zone per organization or user. And this is a little bit more complicated to administer because you have to deal with multiple keys. On the other hand, you're compartmentalizing your encryption and your data so that um, compromising one element of the, of the encryption feature does not compromise more than the encryption zone possibly. So let's talk about the two types of keys. The first type of key is an encryption zone key, and in our slides we designate that with the yellow skeleton key. There's one encryption zone key per encryption zone, and we, uh, it's unique. We hang this off of the encryption zone itself, although we don't hang the actual key on the encryption zone. That stays stored in the KMS and is only handled by the KMS. We do store the metadata info for that key, and that includes the name, the version, the type of key, and the length of the key. We store that in the HDFS name node as an extended attribute of the encryption zone root. The other type of key is a data encryption key, and we designate these with the blue key icon. They take two states, one's unencrypted, or the DEK, the abbreviation, or, and the other is encrypted, which is an EDEK, uh, as we abbreviate it. So there's one DEK per file, and this is the key that's used by the client to encrypt and decrypt data as it's read from the data node. The data encryption key in that form is only ever handled by the client and the KMS. HDFS and the name node or the data node never handle the data encryption key. Um, the encrypted form of that is called the EDEK, and these are, um, encrypted with the corresponding encryption zone key for that file. They're generated on behalf of the name node by the KMS, and they're stored as metadata, as, sorry, as an extended attribute for each file. So there's one of these for every file in the system. And 
although it may sound like we're letting the name node handle keys, in this case we're not because it's encrypted with the encryption zone key. So it is stored there, but only in the encrypted form. And we designate these on the slides with the blue key with the yellow outline. So schematically, let's see how these fit together. The data encryption key is encrypted with the encryption zone key, and that produces an EDEK, the encrypted data encryption key. That encryption is symmetric, and so if you take the EDEK and decrypt it with the encryption zone key, you get the data encryption key back. It's very simple. And then data encryption keys are used to encrypt and decrypt files. So if you take a plain text file and encrypt it with the data encryption key, you get an encrypted file. That encryption is also symmetrical, so if you take an encrypted file and decrypt it with the DEK, you get the plain text file. The third element I want to talk about is the key management server, and this is a caching proxy to a back-end enterprise key store, such as Cloudera Navigator Key Trustee. The KMS is fundamentally providing scalability, high availability, and fault tolerance. And in the one, one side of it is an API, it's a REST API that any service in the cluster can use, not just HDFS for key management services. And on the back side, any, any key store that adheres to the Hadoop key provider SPI, service provider interface, can be used. And that might also be other types of key stores in the back end. So it's providing the scalability, the performance, and the high availability as well as caching. Operations that the KMS provides for HDFS encryption are things like creating and retrieving encryption zone keys, as well as generating um, and decrypting EDEKs. Typically, this is going to run as a separate secure process on a hardened server, and as Andrew said, it's administrated by a separate key administrator that's separate from the HDFS administrator. So let's go through the steps of writing an encrypted file. The client first uh, sends a write request to the name node for a file in an encryption zone. The name node recognizes that that file uh, path name is in an encryption zone and it knows it needs to get an EDEK. So it goes to the KMS and asks it to fetch an EDK and that EDK will actually be created there. The KMS creates a DEK and encrypts it with the EZ key and then passes that back to the name node. The name node then wants to store that EDEK as part of the metadata for that file, and it stores that as an extended attribute. The name node then passes that EDK back to the client. So the client has an EDEK in hand, but it can't really do any encryption uh, using an EDEK. What it really wants is a DEK, the data encryption key. So it passes the EDEK to the KMS and asks it to decrypt it. The KMS decrypts the EDEK using the EZ key and then returns the data encryption key to the client. The client can then use that DEK to write encrypted data to the name node, or to the data node, excuse me. Reading a file is um, similar to that, except that the EDEK already exists for the file and is stored on the name node. So the client requests to open a file in an encryption zone. It asks the name node for the EDEK. The name node returns the EDEK to the client. And now that client needs to get that EDEK decrypted and turned into a DEK that it can use for decryption. So it passes the EDEK up to the KMS. The KMS decrypts the EDEK using the e encryption zone key and returns the DEK to the client. The client can then use that DEK to read and decrypt uh, data from the data node. And that returns it as clear text. So I put these next two slides up on the screen um, just to recap. I'm not going to go through it, but I know people like to take pictures of them, and this will also be on the, the deck on the web so that people will understand the previous diagrams. This just recaps writing the file and encrypted, and this one recaps reading the file. I won't go through the steps there. There are a couple types of access controls that are uh, employed with the encryption feature. The first are the already pre-existing HDFS access controls. These manifest themselves as ACLs and um, Unix-like permissions, and they control the access to the encrypted ciphertext files down on the data node. The second type are KMS 
access controls. And these exist in two forms. They're per operation and per key. Um, the per operation uh, ACLs are both whitelist and blacklist. I won't go into details. It's fairly complex, and it's probably easier to just read the documentation. But to suffice it to say, there are ACLs both at the HDFS level and at the KMS level. So let's talk about some of the attack vectors that are possible. Um, there are three elements in the system. There's the EZ key, there's the EDEK, and then there's the actual ciphertext. And in order to compromise data, an attacker has to have access to all three of those. So let's say they have uh, uh, found the EZ key and that's been compromised. In order to get at anything, they'll also need an EDEK so that they can decrypt that using the EZ key and the ciphertext. So even with an EZ key, uh, it will only compromise a single encryption zone as long as the attacker has access to all of the EDEKs in that encryption zone. So um, in order to compromise an entire encryption zone, you'd need all the EDEKs in that zone as well as the EZ key and access to all the files. Similarly, if you had a compromised EDEK, you'd also need the EZ key to decrypt that EDEK as well as the ciphertext. And in that case, it only leaks a single file. And so on, you can um, go through the exercise of the third case. Let's just briefly look at some of the commands used to create and deploy an encryption zone. As Andrew said, there are three users in the system. There's the key administrator user, there's the HDFS user, and then there's the actual user of the encrypted data. So the first thing to create an encryption zone is to create an easy key. To do that, you just use the Hadoop key create command. In this case, we're creating a key called my key. Then the HDFS administrator actually has to create the encryption zone. To do that, they create a new directory using the make dir command. And in this case, it's users CWL my EZ. You set appropriate uh, ownership and permissions on that using Chown and Chamad. And then finally, you create the encryption zone using Hadoop crypto minus create zone. You specify the key name and the root of the encryption zone. Again, users CWL my EZ. Then as the user, um, it's all transparently accessed just by virtue of the path name that they specify. So any path name in the encryption zone receives the encryption zone treatment. In this example, we'll first create a hello world file outside of HDFS in the host operating system file system. And we'll just echo hello world into that called hello world.txt. Then using the Hadoop FS minus put command in this example, we'll copy that into the encryption zone. Now notice here that it's just by virtue of the path name, user CWL my EZ, that the encryption happens. It's a, in effect a legacy application. We didn't have to modify it. The user didn't have to do anything. So that just writes it into um, the encryption zone as hello world.txt. That command goes out to the KMS, uh, gets the uh, appropriate keys, and so on. Then to read it back, you can use the Hadoop FS minus cat command. You specify the hello world.txt file in my EZ, and you see the decrypted plain text come back. That also is going to the KMS um, and receiving all the keys and using them appropriately. So you might be wondering, well, how do we really know that it was encrypted when it was on disk? Well, we added a special prefix called slash dot reserve slash raw, and you can prefix any path name in the HDFS namespace with this, and if it's in an encryption zone, it will return the raw bytes of the file. We added it really for admin purposes so that they could copy and back up files without having access to the keys. So the HDFS admin, who you might not want to have access to the decrypted data, um, can still do backups without actually having access to the keys. Well, we can also use this for this example just to see the raw bytes of the file and see that they're um, actually decrypted. So we do our Hadoop FS minus cat command again, only this time put on slash dot reserve slash raw. We see the gobbledygook come back and we know that the contents were actually encrypted on disk. At this point, Andrew is gonna um, talk about some of the encryption algorithms as well as some of the performance. So for the first cut of HS encryption, we chose to use AESCTR as our cipher for encrypting and decrypting data. And this can be done with either 128 or 256 bit keys. However, the cipher was designed to be pluggable, so you don't have to use AESCTR, uh, but these other ciphers are 
future work. Uh, one idea is using AES GCM, which would provide authenticated encryption. And this would be a great place for additional contributions if you're interested in using an additional cipher. But let's talk more about AES GTR, namely in terms of performance. So this is joint work done with Intel engineers. And we actually provide two different implementations of AES GTR with ACS encryption. The first is a software implementation using the JCE provided with Java. And the second is a hardware accelerated version using the ASNI instruction set, which wraps, uh, which uses OpenSSL underneath. So ASNI is an instruction set built into many recent processors, uh, which is used to accelerate AES operations. So it's available in Westmere and newer Intel CPUs, but it was also further optimized in Haswell, which is pretty recent. And we were very interested in Haswell performance for ASNI. Let's start by looking at a microbenchmark, where we're simply encrypting and decrypting a one gigabyte byte array using that, uh, trying to compare a the ASNI hardware accelerated version versus the default ver uh, AESCTR implementation built into the Java JCE. So we're just encrypting and decrypting this one gigabyte byte array in a, in a single thread in a tight loop on a single Haswell machine. And since this is a micro benchmark, we're excluding all those issues overheads, things like checksumming, uh, network transfer, as well as additional copies. Let's look at the numbers, though. So we see that for both encryption and decryption, using the hardware accelerated OpenSSL implementation of AES TTR is much, much faster, approximately 16 times faster. And this graph basically tells me that if you're going to be running HS encryption in production, you should definitely be using. Um, an ASNI equipped processor as well as the OpenSSL implementation of AES CTR. So, with that, let's move on to a uh, more macro benchmark. Um, what's the overhead of using encryption versus not using encryption? We chose to use TestDFS IO for this benchmark, which is this very IO heavy benchmark, and we configured it to be reading these very large 300 gigabyte files. And again, we're testing. Uh, encrypting with the OpenSSL uh, hardware acceleration versus not encrypting at all. We're running this on a pretty small three node cluster, so all reads are local. And these nodes only have 64 gigabytes of memory each, meaning that since our files are 300 gigabytes, we're testing at disk speed rather than memory speed. So for our numbers here, we see that we have a slight performance hit for the read side, something about 7.5% impact when you turn on encryption for test DFS IO. And for the right side, we see essentially 0% impact. Uh, this is partly attributed to how the read side is much more optimized than the right side in HGFS. So we see more of a performance difference. So to recap all those performance uh, numbers, uh, we heavily recommend using the OpenSSL ASNI optimized version of AES CTR if you're going to be running this in production, because it's about 16 times faster than the default Java implementation of software. And running test DFS IO, we saw only a very minor impact for reads and almost no impact for writes. It's important to note here also that test DFS IO is a very IO heavy benchmark, and more realistic workloads will see even less impact to their runtime. For instance, we ran TerraSort, which is uh, a much more balanced benchmark. It also has CPU and network shuffle components, not just reading and writing files. And we saw essentially no difference in runtime. So in conclusion, we presented HDFS transparent encryption. This encryption is end-to-end, -end and it happens on the client side. You know, data is protected both when it's at rest, stored on disks, as well as in transit, going over the network. As part of this effort, we've added two new cluster services to your Hadoop cluster. The first, the KMS, or Key Management Server, is a caching high-performance proxy for backing Key Server. In this case, Calera Navigator Key Trustee. Together, these two services provide secure key management, storage, and access for services in your Hadoop cluster. We intentionally designed uh, the KMS and, and key server to be administrated by a separate user. Uh, so we have separate administrative domains for HGFS versus uh, your, your key servers, meaning that we limit the potential damage from a rogue admin attack. Uh, this encryption is, of course, transparent, API transparent, so your existing Hadoop applications will continue to work uh, within an encryption zone. And furthermore, it's performance transparent, meaning that you won't really see a noticeable difference when you turn on encryption for your cluster. Finally, I'd also like to thank the following people who helped out during the development effort for HVS encryption. From Caldera, Alejandro abdel Nur, Aaron T. Myers, Arun Suresh, and Colin McCabe. And from Intel, Yi Lu, and Hai Feng Chen. Thank you very much.
take any questions. Hi, I have a question on the Cloud Air Navigator key trustee. Yeah. So, I mean, on, on a standard name node, you, I, we could bench something like a couple of million uh, kept block locations operations per second. Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a standard kind of right, $5,000 server. Um, what kind of throughput are you getting on, on, on that server? And, and, you know, is the key management server any kind of bottleneck there? Is it is it stateless? Can you distribute it? Uh, right, so you have a couple of different questions there, I guess. So, uh, first of all, performance of the backing key server was your first question, I believe. Yeah, yeah. So, it turns out that these enterprise key servers are actually pretty low performance. Um, we benchmarked, I think, maybe like on the order of hundreds to like low thousands of the like number of key retrieval or creation operations per second, which is not very impressive. And this is part of the reason why we implemented the KMS in the first place. The KMS is this caching proxy in front of the backing key server. So, you can offer much of the work to the KMS rather than going all the way to the, the key server. And that really helps you scale up the number of operations you might expect for a Hadoop cluster. Because after all, when you run like a big MapReduce job, every single mapper is going to be going to the KMS to uh, decrypt and EDEK to read encrypted data. So it needs to be able to handle, again, order tens to maybe hundreds of thousands of operation, operations per second. And it can definitely do that. Um, sorry, what was your, your next yeah, question? Was the, the key management server at the front end, I mean, is it a single machine or can you... Uh, right. So, it, I mean, right. So it is designed to be highly available, so you can actually shard your request across multiple KMSs, and uh, we have like failover as well. So yeah, we can horizontally scale the KMS. And like, what are the possibilities for plugging in a different key value store at the back end behind the KMS? Or right. So it's definitely designed to be pluggable. Currently, the only implementation that we are aware of is Color Navigator uh, Key Trustee, as well as like a uh, the test version, basically, you can use for like, you know, small deployments for testing. Why did you re-implement the, I mean, there's tons of key value ser servers out there. I mean, oh, we didn't re-implement this. Actually, we acquired um, this bit of software from our Gazang acquisition. So Gazang Z Trustee was the old name, and now we've rebranded it as Cloud Navigator Key Trustee. Okay. Right. Thanks. There's one other aspect, which is the name node caches EDEKs, so it has yeah. a cache of them for file creation. Okay, and what, what kind of overhead is a, a, in the metadata in the name node does this introduce, like with your extended attributes right. per file? So basically, so. Like per file, we have to store the encryption key, which is, I think, 16 to 32 bytes, depending on what size you configure, the IV, as well as some initial like, metadata. So we're talking maybe about you know, 50 bytes per file in the encryption zone. Good, great questions. Um, a question regarding your performance uh, set up, the last one. Was this a, a performance set with a, a key for every file, or was it with one encryption domain? Uh, so all encryption keys, like the, all EDEKs are, and DEKs are per file. Um, that's just part of our inherent design. So I guess the answer is yes, they are per file. And another one, uh, can you go back to the slide where you, where you see uh, where the key Rents over the network, because uh, if sorry, I which, which slide? The, the slide where the, where he explains where the key, the EDE keys, and everything go oh, no. over the network. Uh, because if I understood it correctly, in the last transaction, a network administrator would be able to sniff the key. Yeah, you still need to configure uh, like RPC level encryption okay. for a safe transmission of keys. Like the okay, KMS, actually, I think. Uh, requires you to, to use HTTPS, which will take care of this. Okay. Um, what is your experience with backup or disaster recovery systems? How do you handle the encryption and decryption of, of the files on the second cluster? Um, so this was what we added the slash dot reserved raw for was so that the HDFS administrator would not have to, would not be able to um, deal with decrypted clear text data. So we, this CP works fine, and if the administrator doesn't have access to the keys, they just use their dot reserved raw prefix on the source and the target. And if the administrator does have access, 
to the keys, then just CP just works fine anyway with, with access. Does that make sense? Yep. But in a disaster recovery case, you need to you duplicate the keys to the second data center. And are there implemented functions in Navigator? Or? Uh, that's actually a work in progress. So we have um, an existing backup, backup and data, backup and disaster recovery product. And currently, we're adding support for uh, Navigator Key Trustee to this product. So it'll work soon. Any more questions? Uh, could you repeat the question one more time? Do, do you have, a, do you plan, for example, uh, talking about Ashbase, and do you plan to implement encryption at uh, table level or user level? Right. So we've already tested Hbase running within an encryption zone. Basically, you make slash Hbase itself an encryption zone, and then all of your H files and so on are encrypted using HFS transparent encryption, and that works, you know, just fine. But it's it's all HBase which is encrypted. It's right. not very granular. You cannot. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is exactly the trade-off I uh, illustrated in that stack diagram, right? So if you want to express some kind of higher-level policy that goes beyond everything in this directory is encrypted, then it doesn't work. But since the overhead is very low for HBase encryption, like we've tested HBase on top of this, and it's like maybe one or two percent uh, impact in terms of performance. So encrypt all, all things. It's pretty much fine.